Well, good morning, mostly close to afternoon as well, right? Uh, my name is Derek Feldman. I'm going to bring out my friend Namdi here in a minute. But before I do that, I wanted to, to just say a few words about what we have been learning regarding millennials and cause engagement. Uh, I've had the lucky opportunity over the last 10 years to try and understand how a generation gets involved in issues today. And I've had that lucky opportunity to turn it also into an, an application side. And, and through my work, I continue to come back to we have got opportunities more than we have challenges. And I think that's where we are going to talk today, is how do we get a generation focused on an opportunity for others, and that, is, that being education. But I would be remiss to talk and mention one important thing today. Um, this is International Women's Day, right? This is my mom. And this, uh, I went home five years ago for Thanksgiving. And what was fascinating is that she was, uh, she told me right when I walked in in a very humble way, we're downsizing, go get your junk out of your old room. <laughs> and as I was doing that, I walked into there and uh, there was a box that said, for Derek or trash in it. And, and I opened it up and there's this picture in it. And below it said, Annette Feldman signs up her son for Hands Across America. And if you don't know what that is, if you are a millennial, see if this dates you. But this was the ice bucket challenge of that year. I mean, it, we were building a human chain from one end of the country all the way to the other. And that primary focus was helping others in another continent and everywhere else around poverty and, and making sure that we could feed everybody. Raised a ton of money. And this was 86, so if you're curious on how old, maybe consider doing the math uh, in that environment. But thanks to my mom, just like so many other women before us and in our current shoes and in the future that will happen, um, I am proud and thankful for the incredible work that this, this, this group of people do for us in every day. I, I get the time in our research to talk about two populations. And what's important is, is that we, we do spend time talking about two populations of people. There are, there are wonderful people in our society, but unfortunately, at times, we forget the general population and what's happening in there. We tend to focus on the outlier at times, right? Those that are doing incredible, incredible work. And because they're doing incredible work, we tend to think that everybody is just like them. And we forget about those that struggle to get education or those that struggle every single day to get the things that we take for granted. Because sometimes we cloud ourselves with just wonderful people and not necessarily everybody else who's going through a struggle with us. And education is, is no challenge, or not, not exception to that as well. When we think about empathy or how people get involved in movements, it's one thing to feel something for somebody else, but it's another thing to actually move that feeling beyond empathy and say, I'm not just going to be here and feeling sad or challenged, but I am going to feel for you and I'm going to help you. And that's essentially where we see social movements going. They, they trick the brain in a way, right? They help the brain understand that doing a small act can mean something for somebody else. And in fact, it's that brain that tells us what is and how do I help people go forward? Because the brain is a wonderful thing, right? That's essentially why we're here. We're talking about education being a remarkable opportunity for people and other people helping other people see that opportunity and participate in it. But the brain is also a little tricky at times. Because what the brain also does is, is it forces us to either decide if we're going to go forward and whether or not we truly believe in something. Now, here is the thing about believing in somebody else and believing in a concept of an issue and what we discover is, is that you can believe in something and you can be a millennial or a boomer or an Xer or a Gen Z. It doesn't matter. As of today, I could state, and I fully believe this, that this is the year and the day to make girls impossible to ignore. Here, here, right? But you don't have to be a millennial to agree with that statement. You can be whatever age and whatever gender. And so what we have to do is I see and have watched more than 100,000 individuals, millennials, going through our studies year by year, focused on how they get involved in social issues and causes, I keep coming back to I see them acting, I see them participating, but how do we go even further? Which kind of led us to our discussion today and why my friend Namdi is one of those that's going a little further as well. We have to help us all overcome the path of least resistance. It is completely easy 
to fall deeply in love with helping another but not actually doing anything. We've all been there, right? Your brain is tricked at times. Sometimes your brain says to you, oh my gosh, you see somebody that is in pain, and the immediate thing that you're thinking of is, I should raise up and at least help out, but then something else comes in the way, <laughs> right? You work or family or all these other things. And so what's key is overcoming that path of least resistance, really, really coming over and getting it to the point that you say, I'm going to stand up and at least take the first foot and step forward. Because I want to see that others actually believe, just like I do, that they believe in this issue. Because it feels good. It feels amazing to know that the issue you work on, education, is not the only issue that you care about, but actually others. We have a whole event, South by Southwest EDU, is about other people who believe in the power that education can have on people. And essentially, it's comforting to know when you walk through and you see all of the people together and say, Wow, I'm not the only one that believes, because at times, when you're at home, or when you're continuing to work on this stuff, and it doesn't feel that you get anywhere, it feels at times that you're not making the progress that you desire so much. But the comfort in knowing that others believe like you makes you go forward. And you continue to act every single day. Some of you that are designing education programs, getting people involved, you move to reinforce this belief, this idea that if people actually are able to have this opportunity, it will be so much, it will be so more amazing for our population. And so you continue to act and continue to act till you get a point that somebody else spreads it for you. That somebody else is willing to take your, your idea, the amazing thing that you're doing, and actually take the mantle for you and, and go forward without you. That's how movements work. We all start out by, by going from one stage of saying, you know what, I care. I may post something in Facebook or in Twitter or any social network. I may use technology to let everybody else know I care, but I have to feel comforted as well, knowing that I'm not the only one that believes in this. And then once I get past that stage, I want to continue to act in things like education and others and then get a chance to not only spread it, but empower other individuals to feel and do more on their own as well for the issue that we all care about. And over the years, as I've looked at millennial cause engagement, we continue to see that. We continue to continue to see it. Whether you're belonging to an idea at first, or whether you truly believe in it, and then you become an owner. And essentially, own we need to have more individuals going through this process around education. We find that if we truly want to have this, it's you as the individuals that go to other people and say, not only is it safe to say that you want to work on this issue, here's the opportunity, because we know when done well, we can make immense change actually happening. So as we think about the opportunities ahead of us regarding movements and millennials and others, I continue to come back to that we have a unique interest level of the population to do something more amazing. We just have to move them deeper and deeper in our issue, which kind of leads us to, to research. I've, I've led the Millennial Impact Research over the last 10 years with the Case Foundation, Gene Case, Steve Case. And, and one of the major things that we continue to look at is how has this actually changed? What have we learned in 10 years of watching people of this generation going through? And last year in particular was a quite interesting year. Uh, I think we can all say that, regardless of what side, right? And one of the key things that we wanted to see is what's happening now when it comes to issues. And what gives us hope in education is, is that one of the key findings that we saw previous was is that education was one of the key things that this generation was involved with, one of the key particular interests to help other people with. And now that certain other things have happened, we see other pieces that now have come to the forefront. And as we've gone to millennials and others, we say, well, wait a minute, do you not care anymore about education? And guess what the answer is? No, I do, but I also care to have, we have to get these other pieces right as well. And what's also key in that is, is that as we see millennials going through this, it isn't so much that the individual has to be personally affected anymore. It is completely acceptable to stand up for others in which that you're not affected. It's completely okay and feels comforting to know that other people can believe in the idea of education. Whether I'm doing all of these different actions that you see on the screen, or whether I'm going out and organizing my own march or rally for whatever issue it is, 
What's really great about all of this is, is that we strive for a world in which that somebody else is just as equal or even if not better for us as well. And we'll continue to do that. We'll continue to see that. The moment that we hear more of these issues coming out, we'll continue to get inspired and get involved. And we have to harness this opportunity of dissatisfaction is an opportunity of education and others. That we move it from just being disappointed to sitting up and standing up and saying, I want to care about education now, and I want to care about it, and I'm going to bring others with me, because that's the movement that's important as a part of it. So I, I, I kind of end this key piece here with you, is as you work on education, I have to, as somebody who has studied a generational involvement in social issues, education is top of mind. Don't lose hope in that. The second thing is, is that we always have to overcome this challenging brain that says, don't do too much at first. Ease your way into things. See that other people are a part of it. Feel comfort in knowing that. So I ask, as you are leaders, whether you're on the technology side, whether you're in the classroom, wherever you are, you help people go past that path of least resistance and show them that other people believe, just like they do, in the power of education. All right? All right, so I want to, before I bring out my friend Namdi, I want to I, I make sure that you get a chance to see some of his work in action. I've always been a believer in not just what people say, but actually what people do, right? So we, I always match and talk about how do we move interest to deeper action, because it is around action. And, and he has been doing an incredible amount of work in this space. So before I bring him out, I'd like to share a video of some of that work. I applied for the Axe Tour because I wanted to experience new things and for me this was a part of deciding whether or not I want to go away for college, how to be being away from my family and my friends, kind of being on my own. I've never gone outside California, if it's not to Mexico, to visit family members and I've always been intrigued to come to the East Coast and see all the Ivy League schools that are on this side. I was excited because I was going to Boston, like I've always heard like, great things about Boston. Here I am for a whole week being able to see MIT, Harvard, Yale, Boston University, Brown, and even Berkeley College, even though I'm not really interested in music. All these colleges that I really just feel imaginary being in Philadelphia, and knowing that I was going to be able to experience them was just crazy to me. We all connected really fast. It was very interesting to me because I never met a group of people from such different places, and we never talked to each other before. Everybody knows each other on a first name basis, everyone talks, so the togetherness of the group, even us being as far spread apart as from LA to Oakland, or Oakland to Philly, or LA to Philly. Meeting these people my age, my skin color, like people of color, and just being able to talk with them about like issues that we face in school and life in general, and just being able to connect on that level is like amazing. I wasn't expecting that at all, and now that I have met these people, these are going to be lifelong connections. Being from LA, aka the concrete jungle, it gives me a whole new perspective of what the East Coast actually looks like. How the cobblestone streets versus the concrete roads, how the buildings next to each other versus spaces, it makes a difference. Harvard was the first college that we went to, and when we got there, it was pouring rain, and I wasn't sure whether or not we were gonna be walking around the campus like that, because it was raining pretty heavy. But Justin, our tour guide, he was very informative. He gave us all the information that we needed. He was relating to us as students. He was telling us fun stories about the campus. It was a good experience. So right now, we're in Memorial Hall. I, I love it when people walk in here, and I just get to see your, you see your jaws drop like this. When I was able to actually go into MIT and see that I might actually have a chance at applying, being accepted, we actually did this balloon experiment and just like seeing what it actually feels to be like an engineer since that's one of the courses that I'm going to want to take when I go into college. And really just being able to not only just experience it, but also being experiencing with my peers and seeing their opinions on it too. Not only are we here just to visit colleges, but we're here to give back to the community of Boston and to experience the culture. You know, just knowing that not only in Los Angeles are there people in need, but also all around the world. What Kratos to Crayon does is they take care of any kids who really need that extra help that they can't receive, you know, based on their circum circumstances. And it really brings a warm feeling to the heart knowing that you can give back to the community.
We first left Boston early in the morning, not knowing where we were going, and once we got to Yale, we went into the Afro-American Culture Center, and Dean Holloway gave a speech to us about his experience at the university and how it has affected him and how he has tried his best to help improve the ethnic and cultural aspect of it. Wherever you end up, you must not let anybody tell you that you don't belong in that place. Wherever you go, they've admitted you. And when they've admitted you, they said, we want you to be part of our community. I liked the open curriculum that Yale had, which offered many choices and classes, which I really want to have and also being able to talk with all those people that go to Yale, that go there for support, have that community within Yale is like awesome and I want to be a part of that community. I want to have those friends to rely on. As college is getting closer and closer, you start to realize that the world is bigger than what you think it is and just learning that you're not the only one out here is sort of scary and I feel like it's really a great opportunity for me to see someone who really does understand that like Namdi and the Asamoah Foundation. I've realized that being from different racial groups or having different religions and all connecting on like the same level, it showed me that we could all work together and we can make a change. We can make the change that we want to see happen because we are the future. We are the people who can make a change. If you pass it on to another person, another person passes on to another person, the chain will eventually continue to where everyone is getting the help that they need and the exposure and that really changes your perspective. It's hard for someone to get into your life and really reach you and you not be changed. Thank you, Nandi, so much. I don't know what I did to deserve this, but I'm so grateful and I feel like a new person. I feel like I've experienced so much in such a little time. I will be forever thankful to Namdi and the Asuma Foundation for this opportunity. And I'm sure not just me, but the rest will be because it's an opportunity that will shape our lives forever. Let's welcome Namdi Asamoah. Come on out. Thanks for going. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> that made me want to cry. I was thinking, <laughs> I've seen it before. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Uh, so let's begin with why this? Why this? T I, I mean, I suspect that there have been other things that people have asked you to address talk about, get around. I'm sure you get pitched a lot of ideas and other things, but yeah. why education? Why, why this? Um, anybody from uh, UC Berkeley out here at all? Anybody know someone that went to UC Berkeley? Okay, cool. <laughs> Just like to make that connection. Um, I went to UC Berkeley, um, and I, I think that's where it all started. I was on the football team there, and there was a guy that came up to me and he just said, you know, we're looking for football players that want to give back to the community. And I said, sure, I'll do it. And, you know, I had no experience doing that, but I just fell in love with the work that we were doing with little kids. So um, I got to the NFL and I, I think my second year in, I wanted to take some, some kids from Oakland fishing because... Why not? We, why not? <laughs> um, and so I took some kids from the inner city in East Oakland, like maybe six kids. We went fishing. It was maybe about six hours north of Oakland. And so we're driving. We get there, and we just have this great time. We're there for two days. Um, and then we come back. And the moment that I dropped them off to go back home, one by one, the kids just started crying. And these were all boys at just 12, 13 years old. I all just started crying and it was, you know, and it affected me because they were saying, you know, we've never had an experience like this and now we're going back to our homes where, you know, we don't know where food's going to come from, we don't know if we're safe, this, that, and the other. And so uh, then I just said, I want to do something that's more sustainable, something that lasts a little bit longer I'm with them. So I thought of this college tour. And I started taking high school kids from Oakland, specifically when I started, on college tours across the country and, and then sticking with them through high school and into college and just being a mentor towards them. Let's, let, how many tours since you started? Uh, it's been about, it's, I think this will be the 13th when, when we go in a month. Yeah. So there's... There's one every year, and the video that you guys just watched, we went to Boston, that was last year. Um, the year before that was New York, I think, Atlanta, 
DC, you know, so it just changes every year and we get these students together yeah. um, and do it. So this is the 13th. So I, I, I always love to talk about the, tour, you know, the thing, early days. So tell yeah, me yeah. about tour one. What was that like? Tour one, we had four students. So when the fishing trip was six, it was like six or seven students. And tour one was four students and I was just trying to figure it out. Yeah. You know, so I, I worked with a, a youth development center in East Oakland. We found four high achieving students, um, you know, that would never have had this opportunity. And we grabbed them, got on a plane and, and went to Atlanta. And that's the thing about these students is they're in, they were in Oakland. Now I've, I've been working with students in Los Angeles and Philadelphia as well, but they were in Oakland. And if you guys have ever been to the Bay Area, you know, Oakland's here and San Francisco is right there. Like it's just, just get on a bridge and just go, it's right. You can open up your window, you can see, you know, yeah. San Francisco. And, but these kids, don't, San Francisco's like a dream to them. They've never been to San Francisco. You know, they're 17 years old. I don't think I'll ever be able to go to San Francisco. It's right there, <laughs> you know what I mean? like, yeah. and it's so that would that would blow my mind. And I just figured if I could find a way to get them out of their comfort zone right there, then that could be you know a source of education for them. Yeah. What, what have you started to learn from the students that you're working with? I mean, talk talk to us about the perspective from their shoes. Um, Kanye West has this quote: "Listen to the kids, bro." Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's, it seems really simple, and it actually is. You know, there, I finished these tours. It's, so you see what's, what has happened in Parkland, yeah. Florida, and you see the students that are coming up at the rallies, and they're speaking, they're on TV, and they're speaking, and they're just asking for us to listen to them so that we can make changes and make it better. And it's, it's really that simple. When we were kids, all we wanted was for the adults to hear our side of it. Yeah. You know, it's like those students, they're basically saying, whether you do it or not, when it's my turn, I'm gonna get it done. And that's what my students are saying. So we'll finish a tour, we'll come back, it'll be a month later, and I'll sit the students down and we'll just do an evaluation, what worked, what didn't, and why from the tour, how can we get better? And they are, they're great, and I take, I implement everything that they say into the next tour and it continues to get better and better. Um, so those are the lessons that I've learned for, from them is that many times they're more knowledgeable about things than I am. And it's, it's, just, about, um, it's just about listening to yeah. them. Talk about the, the, the tour right now. What are sort of the components? What are the things that you're doing when you're doing this? Yeah, it's all, it's, so I, you guys saw in the video, it's not just a college tour. Um, you know, we go around to the city. What, what didn't show up in that video was some of the stuff, like we'll go to a basketball game or we'll, we'll, we'll meet up with, um, you know, someone in the political field in that city. Um, we'll, you know, one time we were in New York, we saw Hamilton, you know, because we talked to their education department and they donated tickets, you know. So Very cool. it's just sort of getting the full experience. I think for me, I think, it's, it's not just about the classroom. I think so much more of the education comes outside of the classroom and just being outside of your comfort zone. So yeah. that's... And you have a mentor program. The mentoring program, yeah. So we finish the tour. Once you're in on the tour, then you're with us for the rest of your high school um, career. Is that what it is? <laughs> Let's use it. It's not tenure. <laughs> um, for the rest of your time in high school. You're with us, and then into college, these students are, you know, contacted by us. They're contacting us. We see them all the time. They give back. We continue to give back to them. So it was from the fishing trip that I was talking about. I just wanted to be in their lives for a longer period of time. Yeah. I, I mean, I, sus I suspect part of that of being in their lives is based upon things that you were seeing in other education programs as well, maybe? I mean, is it that... Is it essential that, to you that we have this longer-term involvement in this? Because I think that's what we're talking about here. Yeah, I think so. I, I think um, it's essential, but it, sometimes the kids just, or the kids, sometimes people just need to be shown a thing, and, and many times they're able to take it from there. I think it helps, and, and it is essential for me and what I do to stay in their lives because the situation that these students come from is so 
tragic. You know, you're, I'm talking about students that have, this is why we go to a Yale or a Harvard or, you know, something like that. These students have, you know, 4.0 GPAs and, the, you know, they're top of their class and the, all sorts, but they're in the toughest neighborhoods um, that you could possibly be in. So their whole thought process is there's no college. I'm going to stay here. Yeah. You know, I'm going to take care of grandma. And, and the rest of my siblings here, there's nothing after this. No one else in my family's been to college, so it doesn't really matter. But my grades are good enough because I, you know, I know how to apply myself. In it. And so I find those students and make sure that I can stay in their lives. Because if, it's, if I drop in and drop out, then they'll never think about it again. Yeah. You know, so I just try to st stick with them so that they can you know, keep it front and center in their mind. Yeah. Talk about how do we get a generation involved in helping each other like this? Because this is about getting millennials or others, individuals, to care about education and help others. What's your viewpoint on how we get people to view education as an opportunity here? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly how to answer that. I guess, I guess I would say it's just, you know, I try to keep things simple. If wherever you work, you know, whatever job you have, I think it's very easy to say, I'm going to find three or four um, high school kids in my community, and what I'm going to do is on um, making this up on the spot. On next Monday, we're going to have Shadow Me Day or something, you know, and you're going to yep. find those three or four students, um, and you're just going to bring them to your job. They're going to shadow you for the day, and that could change their lives right there. It doesn't have to be taking them on tours across the country and doing some sort of um, magnanimous thing, or it's like the biggest thing that you've ever done in your life. Really just bringing them into your environment and showing them what it's like to, I don't care if you work at Starbucks, you know, or you work at McDonald's, just bringing them there and showing them a different side of life, I think that's you can find education in so many things. You know, I think we get bogged down in the whole idea of sitting in a classroom, but it's really just being outside of your comfort zone and, and, and failing and risking, and that's when you learn the most. So part of this has the mentorship. I suspect you start to see individuals take on their own their path forward, right? Their own education, when they're taking agency of that in some way. Yeah, it's funny, like I've, I've had students who, you know, I'll take sophomores and juniors, but I'll have a student who then becomes a senior in high school and is telling me, yeah, I got together with some of my friends and we're doing what you do. So we're taking seventh graders and bringing them to our high school <laughs> so that we could show them what high school looks like for them. And, and that stuff just really, you know, that touches me because I'm, I don't even know that I'm giving them these sort of lessons, but the fact that they're coming away with, I can take control, I can be a leader, I can do the same things that, are, that have been done for me, I can do that for someone else. The, you know, that's, that's the impact that you know, I'm, I'm proud that I'm, I've been able to make. Has anything changed programmatically in the last couple of years based upon what they're telling you right now, some of the challenges they're facing and so on? Yeah, you know, good question. We started a, um, we had never done this before. And then two years ago, I'm trying to think what the impetus was. We, uh, we started a town hall. Oh, it was the, um, remember when there were these, these shootings that were happening and then, and then the Dallas police officers mm -hmm. shooting, you know mm -hmm. what I'm talking about? I, I, seems like it was, I don't know, I guess it was 2016. Um, and there was this big national conversation. So the students were like, can we talk about this? How, who can we talk about this with? What can we do? Like you yearning know, to have a conversation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'm looking, you know, I don't have Facebook, but I'll sneak on their Facebook pages. You're a lurker, right? I'm a lurker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and so I'll get on their Facebook pages, and I see, like, some of the craziness on the Facebook pages. I'm like, is that Natalie? She's saying that? You know? <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, we need to do something. And there, everybody's getting upset and angry, and we need to channel this. And so we started a town hall um, that now we do every year, just where we bring as many students as we can in Los Angeles 
into a room. Um, so it's maybe we get about 500. And we sit there. We had police officers up there. We had students up there. We talked. Um, we, we're now doing one on um, sexual assault on campus. Um, you know, so it's just, it's whatever the students want to hear. We start a town hall and we talk to them about it. And that's all brand new. That's just from me listening to them and them getting, wanting to get their voice out. Well, what advice do you have to those sort of in the listening? So, you know, these are listening sessions right, as right. well. I mean, what have you learned is the best way to facilitate something like this? Um, the best way to put it together? Well, yeah. just in terms of, you know, if you're going to hold a town hall like this, because essentially you're talking about some pretty deep topics. Yeah, I mean, all I do is just um, go on YouTube and see other town halls. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, where do I find? Is it Google? And <laughs> yeah, I Google it, and then I just read. Everything in life is so simple, man. Yeah. We don't have to. So I just look at how other people did it, and I take what I liked from each one of those and put it together. So we would have, um, you know, the officers speak about what's going on from their point of view. Um, we would have some students speak about their point of view. We would then go into breakout sessions, and they would, you know, we they would put together this program of like how to be better in the community for everyone. It was just a just an amazing event with the the goal of just finding peace in the community, um, and that was just for me going on YouTube, yeah. and just finding what works and, and putting it together. Based upon your work and where education is today, is there something that really you're still concerned with uh, in education overall right now that keeps sort of top of mind whether you can address it or not? Is there anything in particular you've been really focused on? Yeah, I mean, there, there are a few things. With the students that I work with, their biggest issue is the financial aspect of it. You know, yeah. they don't even... I'll say, are you, are you interested in college? You have, you know, you have great grades, and you know this could be really special for you. And this and it. Yeah. If we're at college, and I don't know, you know, first of all, no one in my family has been to college, and second, we couldn't afford. I couldn't afford college. And I say, how do you know you can't afford college? Oh, that's what my grandma told me. Mm. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. And they're they're not at the high schools where. Um, you know, it's t they're told about financial aid and scholarships and that sort of thing. Um, so they need someone to tell them. And that's, like, that's one of the biggest things. Yeah. So I try to have these, these sessions, uh, you know, every few months that are financial literacy um, sessions for the students, talk about financial aid, talk about scholarships. We give scholarships from our foundation. Um, that's the biggest thing, I think. Oh, the other, the other crazy thing. It's not crazy. I think you kind of talked about it. Was this sense of belonging? Yeah. The students that I work with, they feel like they don't. That there's no place for them at, at college, because yeah, they can have great grades. They can have these, you know, SATs scores that are, you know, through the roof. But they also still sound like they're from the hood. You know, a lot of them. Um, they also have never seen. They don't know what college sort of looks like when they do go on a campus, they don't really see people that look like themselves a lot. And so they're, you know, they don't feel like they belong. So it's, it's easy for them to say, oh, college isn't for me. Yeah. No, it's not for me, but you know, I'll, I'll figure it out. And that's where the mentorship the support that's where system. We, yeah, because you Millennials can get involved in those kinds of things. Absolutely, because until they, I, I always say until they, did you see Black Panther? Mm -hmm. Did anybody see Black Panther out here? So, so you guys will know what I'm talking about. And if you didn't, I don't think this is a spoiler. Um, <laughs> you, can, you can close your ears. But there's a, there's, a, there's a character who he says, he says, my dad always used to tell me that if I could ever see Wakanda, it has the most beautiful sunsets, and it has the you know the most beautiful rivers and the the greens. Yeah. And you guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And um, so he kind of makes it his life's mission to see what his dad was telling him about. And you know that's it's a movie, and it it just struck me because that's so much of what I'm doing and what we're doing in this space is if these students 
if you don't tell them that it exists, if you don't show them that it exists, they're never going to reach for it. You know, that's not going to be a thing that they think is even in their grasp. Yeah. And so I think that's the biggest thing for me is just kind of just setting it up for them. No, this does exist. I, they, someone asked me recently, like, who were your heroes growing up? And I, and I could have said Magic Johnson, and I could have, you know, said some conventional ones. And I said, you know what? I grew up in a very um, strict religious, you know, household where things were, you know, it was, it was one way, it was this, and, and that's it. Yeah. You know? Stay in um, line. Stay in line. That's it. There's, you know, don't look left, hmm. only look that way. Um, and then I went to UC Berkeley. <laughs> and <laughs> if you know anything about Berkeley, <laughs> I mean, it just changed my entire perspective and it really, um, I just became much more empathetic and much more accepting and I was fighting for the rights of people that I had nothing in common with or would have never thought that I would and it just changed me completely and, and so I said one of the heroes for me is UC Berkeley, you know, and it's, I think if they don't know that, if students don't know that this experience can be a hero for you, it can save you, it can put you on a, a path for success. If you're not telling them, if you're not showing them, then they're never going to, I mean, how many are going to reach for it? What's the next milestone? Yeah. 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 So we're going to get to some audience questions, so feel free to put those in uh, as we do this before this next question. But, uh, you know, w what's the future hold for the foundation and what you want to do? I mean, have you realized everything with it? I mean, obviously, there's so much need, there's so much opportunity, but... I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm very much uh, uh, in the moment type of person. You know, I, I do have some great people in my team that think to the future, but I'm very much in the moment and what's going to happen, you know, w the next year. Yeah. But not really You haven't figured out life right now? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> haven't figured out life. If you do, so, let me know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I, but it's, it's grown, you know. I was, I was taking 24 students on college tours and thinking that I was reaching some, but you know, there are thousands that apply. And it, it breaks my heart to say no to the other, yeah. the other 3,000 because they, are, they deserve to be on the tour, you know, but you can only take so many. So I figured, you know, how can I help more students? So then I started a, a college fair program. So now I'm helping almost a thousand students in Los Angeles per year because they're coming to these fairs and I'm bringing the colleges to them yeah. as opposed to them going to the colleges and, and it's, a, it's a great experience in itself. So I think just being in the moment for me I think is great and then listening to what the kids are saying helping me for the next year but five, ten years down the line I'm, I, still, I still don't know how it's going to shape out. Yeah. Every year is a new experience. Yeah, well, um, new challenges. I bet. The new challenges, yeah. yeah. All right, so first question is, what type of support services do you provide students during their time in college to persist? And can you share some high school and college graduation stats? But we'll do the first one first. <laughs> what was that? What, can I share high school and college Can you stats? share some stats um, based upon your students, I suspect? But, oh. Yeah, so it, it yeah. basically, is the tour working? What do you see in work? Or how, is it, how are you measure success from your standpoint? I'm, I have a very low bar. Um, <laughs> there are people, there are people in the foundation that are always sort of pounding me on this, like we need these, these measurables. And for me, I'm just, I'm happy to change one student's life in all the ones that I work with. Um, so it's never really about, did I get 99% to, to feel a certain way? Um, you know, I just do what I do, and I hope that one of them has has been changed, and that that rate is a hundred percent. Oh, good. <laughs> Every year. Yeah. Um, so, in 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 terms of impact and, and personal, I, I suspect every student's got a personal story that you're trying to overcome and, yeah. and help them there. Uh, I mean, is there? Is there commonality or is it more individual one-on-one -on -one sort of helping them in their own situations? It's definitely individual. Yeah. 
Every student is different. Taking the time. It's taking the time with each student and making, um, you know, each student feel like they matter in the moment, even if you're in a room full of students. The student that's speaking, the one that you're speaking to, making sure that they, they know that they matter. Um, we've had homeless students. We've had students that, you know, lived on Skid Row. But we're 4.0 students, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and but really didn't think there was going to be life outside of living in that, that uh, area. Um, we've had students who, you know, who watched their dad kill their mom, who watched it, mm. you know. Um, we've had students who have had siblings. That, and I, there are so many things that they go through. They don't know if they're going to be safe leaving their house, walking to school each day. But they're so focused when they get in the classroom. Yeah. And, it's, and these students exist, and if we, if we don't take the time to find them, then you know, they never become what they could be. Yeah, and as you're mentioning that, that ideal, helping them see what the ideal is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's a social media Wakanda. question. What's that? Let's see Wakanda. Wakanda. There's a social media question on here. You mentioned looking at a couple of your students' Facebook pages and so forth, and like, whoa, there's some interesting stuff. Yeah. You know, how do you, you know, the question here is around how do they not get discerned from all this challenge of the conversation? I mean, what, what's your viewpoint on all of the? Um, you know, I'm for it. Yeah, I'll say, I'll say whoa, because it's, because most of the time I get one side of the student, uh, they're on their best behavior. When they're with you? They, yeah. So like, so, I don't want him to be disappointed? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so when I sneak on their Facebook pages and they're like cussing out the government and stuff like that, I'm just like, oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> delete this. Do you end up pulling them aside and saying, we got to have a talk? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've had some talks with a couple of them, but it's, but it's all productive. Um, and they lead to the town halls that we've done. And so I'll say, whoa. But at the same time, I'm actually supportive and proud that they have a voice in the way that they, they do. I think that they should, you know, I try to get them to, to use their voice in a certain way and make sure that it's positive change that they're making um, and positive words that they're speaking. But I'm excited when I see students active socially and, and really trying to change things. Yeah. You know, and that's, it's interesting because we were, over the course of the last three or four months, following individuals, millennials, and their social cause engagement online, and, you know. What's a millennial? What age is 80 to 2,000, although Pew Research said it stopped at 96 this last week, so it depends if you like them or not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so 80 to 96. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, you, you hear the, you hear the, they see the discourse, but not everybody's active in the discourse. You know, there's a lot more people watching it yeah. than they are necessarily active in it. And that's what we found. And the ones that are active in it are definitely active in right, it. Right, right, right. Right? Why don't, why don't I think I'm a millennial? I don't know. What's going on? Do you like the generational trait or the generational names? Uh, yeah, I'm not opposed to that. What is it, like Gen X, Gen Y? Yeah, what? and Boomer and... Z. I thought I was before, I was born, sorry, I was born in 81. You're, you're technically in the category. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> I made it. You're supposed to save the world with everybody. Okay. <laughs> great, great. I like it. Um, what's the, uh, this is an interesting question, because this goes around to the support piece. What's the family engagement? I mean, because these, you're bringing students to colleges, seeing what the opportunity is, helping them understand all this. Where does the family support come in all of this? And how do you interact with that or don't you? It varies per student. There, sometimes there's absolutely no family support at all from these students. So we then become... You become more of that? We become more of that. And we have a great staff of, of, of people at the foundation that really take it to heart and, and get in these, these students' lives. You know, sometimes there are no parents, like I said, there are, you know, might not even be grandparents, they might be at a homeless shelter or something like that. Um, so, but we try to get in there and be sort of that, that family. And then sometimes there, you know, both parents are there and it's, the parents really want this to happen, but the parents don't have an education. Yeah. You know, they've never been through anything. This like is not this. a pathway they've been on. Right, they haven't yeah. been on this, but they want it 
and the parents, sometimes those parents want it so bad, and I love when that's when that happens because then they allow their students to be a part of everything that that we're doing, all the sessions that we're doing, and anytime we have someone come in to speak, that I could take my daughter, you know, let my son go, um, and it's you know it's great. Yeah, and so it varies. Yeah. And I can see you filling in holes as sometimes teachers do on their own. With yeah, that. absolutely. Yeah, no, very similar. The beautiful thing about that. Um, in in terms of the, there's an argument that some may make, which is you might be taking some of the best, right? The 4.0. That's in a very challenging situation. Yeah. What about you know? What about not necessarily the high achievers? Are, you know, what do you do around that situation? Yeah. You know what? I've taken like over the years. I've heard so many complaints. I've had that one. I've had. Um, I suspect you get a lot of this, right? I do. I, I've gotten. Um, well, why don't you take the third graders on things? Because that's the real age when it turns over, you know. And I listen to people, and then you know, and some people are like, "Yeah, you take. You're helping sophomores and juniors, but in eighth grade, right before high school." That's where the most insecurity happens. And so I'm listening, and I'm just like, <laughs> I can do so much, and, I, and I'm so happy with And that's the type of guy that I'm like, I'll, I'll take a lane and really try to be great at that lane and make an impact in that lane. Um, so yeah, it's, I mean, it's a great question, and there are great people that focus on that group. And so we do have a network of those sort of organizations that we then will, you know, piece people together with. But that's, it's just not the, what we do right. with our organization. But I, we know plenty of organizations that work with the students that need help in school and, you know, that sort of thing. We want to work with the students that are, in their own right, being sort of ignored. And they have a ch they have a great chance of disappearing, despite how great they're doing in school. Yeah. Another question is is uh, in our work we often hear students say they don't see themselves on campuses. You mentioned taking them to Ivy's. Any HBCU visits? Yeah. So we we do we've been to several. I mean, my very first year when I took the four students, um, we went to Atlanta, and. It was just, and it was the reason that I wanted to keep it going. You know, and it's also the reason why I started doing things outside of the colleges. So the first year, we went to Atlanta, and I had, um, you know, four African American students from East Oakland, and we were going to go to Spelman, Morehouse, um, Clark Atlanta. Uh, you know, I think at the time Morris Brown. Uh, you know, so there were these there were these HBCUs that we were going to. We also went to Georgia Tech and, and Georgia Southern. Um, and we were just supposed to go to the colleges, and I didn't know any different. And so this is listen to the kids, bro. I went. We went to the colleges, and it's there are two days left, and we're getting ready to leave. And the kids, you know, they. I'm, I'm. It's like at the end of the day, we always debrief, and then they go to their rooms, and then we see them in the morning. And so I said, okay, guys, good night. You know, have a good night. I'll see you. You know, wake up at uh, you know 7:30, and then we'll get going. You know, can we talk to you? I said, sure. And you pull me to the side. At the time, there was this movie called Atlanta. No, it was called ATL. Um, that was out. Anybody know what ATL is? The movie? A couple of you? Okay. There was this movie called ATL, and they were like, "We've never been to Atlanta, so this is great, and we thank you for the colleges." Uh, but there's this skating rink called uh, Cascades. Um, do you mind if we go skate tomorrow night? And this and I said, no, we're not skating. We're not. <laughs> and I was like, absolutely not. Like your parents told me this and that and that and that. We're just doing colleges. I bet they were going trying on. to really persuade you too. Oh yeah, they were. Yeah, going they were throwing it all in. The, yeah. They threw it all in. And so they went to sleep. We woke up in the morning, and I was just like. Yeah, they should be able to go to Cascades and go put on some roller Came skates and go, you know, because it was the big thing in the movie. Yeah. And so I, call, I, I spoke to their parents. I said, are you okay if we do? And they're like, absolutely. You guys should be doing that. Have fun. Da, da, da. So that night we went and, it, it, you know, 
changed their lives. Like these are moments that they needed. And so I was listening to them. And so then the next year, it became about more than the colleges. It became about, okay, what else can we do in this particular city that's going to help you experience something that you would have never experienced? And again, that's education for them. Yeah. You know, and it's, uh, so that's another uh, shout out to Kanye for that. <laughs> He'll appreciate all this. Yeah, yeah. shout out. Absolutely. Uh, we were at South by. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard not to talk about technology. What are you? Are you guys incorporating any technology into the program? Are you doing anything in terms of training and development around that, with some of the students, mentorship, or is it? Um, God, I'm not, I'm I'm the least tech savvy. Per That's why I didn't think I was a millennial. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Well, you were looking so at everybody cool else's Facebook like, pages. Too. Yeah, that's right. I was going to do Facebook. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's a. Gra I've been really into to tech this year. I've gone to a few conferences, um, just to get to to learn more about it and see how we can implement it. Uh, we work with Sunshine Sex, yeah. as you know, who who are very um, involved in the tech world, and so I think that's something that we can do. We have students all the time that are you know, into tech stuff and they really want to get into it. So I think that's a, maybe I'm listening to you now. That's another thing that we can do. Uh, all right, so let's talk about some, by the way, you have some love out there from a school counselor. Did you see that? Oh, nice. It's number two. Um, oh, nice. I got some fans in here. Um, all right, so let's talk about next, uh, uh, first. The counselors are, are the best. The, the okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, the counselors at the schools, man, when you talk about, um, you were talking about teachers who are also great, but we were talking about family engagement. Yeah. The counselors become family as well, you know, and they're the people that we have the direct connection with for the students if we can't reach a parent. Yeah. Or regardless, on the, at the high school, we're talking to the counselors, and they're fighting for their students all the time, and, you know, I absolutely love um, the counselors that we work with. Yeah. And they need more recognition. Teachers need it, but you know, also counselors really do. They do a lot of work, great work. You know, what's interesting is as you're talking about the informal components to the program versus the formal education as well that exists, the two balance and complement and say it stay on the same track. Mm. I compare that to when we look at research about how somebody gets involved in an issue, it's not necessarily that they're being affected and going up a formal route. It's all the informal, the conversations, the learning, mm. the experiences. Is I mean, the formal not effective? I don't know. This is the formal, right? Yeah, what we're doing be, right Yeah, now. but it would be more of the, if you and I had a conversation and we're impacted outside of here and discussed together and said, you know, this is what life is. Yeah, that's where the work happens, right? Yeah. 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 Interesting. So um, the... Any big wins that you've had? They, they talk about that. That was one of the top questions. Any of the biggest wins for, that you would say, you know, in the last, last years, I would say I'm most proud of this moment. Early on, I mean, when our first homeless student, I was very proud of the fact that, you know, he would have never, he wasn't thinking about college in the way that he, he we would have liked him to be thinking about it. And, you know, till this day, he says that the tour is the only reason that he ended up going to college, um, you know, and everything that's in. Now he's like getting into politics and all sort of things. And that's a big win. We had a student um, once from East Oakland that I think he got into seven of the Ivy League schools. This was maybe six or this was, he's still at Yale. So this was um, like four years ago or so. Um, but that was, it's, it's those types of moments. And then we've had students that have gone on to community college, but now are, you know, working in, in businesses that they didn't think that they'd work at before. And just seeing them all come back and want to help out and be a part of the tour, I think you know, those are all sort of the big wins. Yeah, yeah. And, and as you look at some of these situations, are you continuing to follow them? through the years, or try to? The students? Yeah. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. So we have, we have, um, we have different things that we do all the time where I, we get the students back that have been on tours, and we all just go somewhere and you know, have a great day together and just spend some time outside of us contacting them and being you know, in their lives um, throughout the years. But yeah, we're always getting back together. It's great. 
It's always great to see them, especially when you haven't seen them in a long time, yeah. three or so years. It's great. So one of the questions right now is around your family and others. Are they involved as well? You're it's a yeah. It's a family foundation actually. Yeah. It's um. Well, it's the Asimov Foundation, so kind of gives a little bit of a hint there that that might. Yeah, be. That's, right. <laughs> that's right. So my my mom actually um, started working with orphans and widows in Nigeria because we're Nigerian, and she started doing that years before I started this tour, and so I was doing the tour and she was doing that, and we said, why don't we bring them together, and just start the foundation, and so that's what we did, and now. You know, everyone in the family is now a part of it and, and helping out. Yeah, yeah. They were asking about Carrie and your immediate family too. They were. Yeah, oh, they were. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Everybody's supportive. It's, Very cool. It's, yeah, it's great. Everyone is supportive, and everyone has their their role in the foundation. And you know, I always get people that that say they want to start family foundations, and they they say, but my family doesn't get along with each other. <laughs> so how do we start the foundation? And, you know, I, I have absolutely no advice for them. <laughs> but it's uh, because it is challenging. Um, but I think when, you know, I guess when you're, when you have one goal and it's not about who's getting the credit, yeah. I think that really helps. And I think that's what's made us successful. All right, so last question for you, because we're going to wrap up here. Um, how, what would be your advice to just anybody not involved in education to get involved in education? You know, for those, because we've been talking, there's individuals in the audience who are school counselors and teachers and deep involved, but what about the general public? What would be your advice to get in, how to get involved? What should they be doing? Um, I, I guess, I don't know. I don't know, it's a good question. It depends on how you define education. I mean, if education to them is something that's going to be very stiff, and like I tell you about the classrooms all the time, then it's going to turn some people off because that's not for everyone. But education is in the smallest things, you yeah. know. Um, so, again, it's like when I was saying earlier, there's something easy that you can do in, in bringing someone to your job and having them shadow you, and you don't think about that necessarily as education by you know, definition, but that's what's happening. So I guess it would be just finding, I, I hate saying this word, but uh, finding slick ways of getting, or alternative ways of getting um, people involved in education, ways that don't seem so, um, you know, structured, um, just ways that are more free-flowing and informal, and you kind of, trick them into being a part of the education world. Yeah. 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 I, I have sort of found something similar, too. When, I, when we observe people, they tend to find unique ways to just have a conversation to yeah. push them further yeah, into a right. formal way. That's right. As well. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks, my friend. Oh, Wonderful great. job. Oh, Give him a hand. Awesome. Thank you, guys. And uh, I, I'd say, too, that as for anybody involved in education, incredible job. It's the hardest job. And uh, you all deserve a round of applause as well. Thank you. Thank you.